So, good morning, good evening, good late, late night, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, as we've said many times, uh, uh, we passed, oh gosh, a little over a year ago where the majority of our viewers are not in the U.S. That's where we're located. The majority of our viewers are outside. So depending on where you are in the world, uh, have a good day and um, and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to just talk about a few stories. Stories help us understand life. And if there's one area that's really, really difficult to understand, it's cardiovascular disease, it's chronic disease, it's Alzheimer's, it's um, heart attack, stroke, you know, guess what? The best medical systems in the world struggle to understand it. So <clears throat> uh, we're taking a few uh, items out of the book, a few stories that we told in the, uh, in the book that we uh, made available. And we're talking about some patient stories, again, to help people start thinking about what does this actually look like? And, you know, you get that, that, that phrase is worn out, but it's worn out because it's true. Often it's not what you think. You know, we've got a story about somebody who was tall and thin, had two stints. Mm, why? Um, talk about females having problems. You know, it's supposed to be men with heart attacks, right? Ah, not so quick. Um, and, and it's supposed to be, women are supposed to have problems with breast cancer. Well, you know, that's true. But a lot more people die, a lot more women die from heart attack and stroke than breast cancer. So again, hopefully these stories help pierce some of the incorrect myths that are out there about cardiovascular disease. Now you'll see that the names have been changed not to protect the innocent, but to protect privacy. Now, you probably you might actually recognize a couple of the stories because a couple of these individuals have actually appeared on the show to tell their story. Uh, but again, um, it's better to be overly conservative in terms of protecting confidentiality than under conservative or take any chance. So if, if you're new to this channel, what we do is we talk about the things that are killing and disabling more people in this world than anything else, more people than the pandemic. Believe it or not, let me repeat it, killing and disabling more people than the pandemic, more people than car wrecks, more people than gunshot wounds, more people than violence from uh, invasions of countries, more people than war. In fact, if you look at war, there's a, there's a very telling statistic. You go to the Vietnam War Memorial in, the, in Washington, D.C. in the United States, and it's very dramatic. It's got the name of every person, every um, U.S. serviceman that died in that war. When you look at cardiovascular disease, we have one of those going on every two weeks. And what is, that's also equivalent to what? A couple of airliners going down every day from these diseases. And guess what? Again, our medical systems, the U.S. loves to tout itself as having the best medical system in the world. And this medical system has been demonstrated time and time again to that two thirds of the doctors, primary care doctors, doctors that are practicing the prevention out there don't know how to diagnose, let alone manage the major cause of these problems. So, We'll get into that before we talk about it, but just a few more comments about uh, what we have available on the channel in terms of content. The vast majority of the content is absolutely free and that's on purpose. A lot of people are saving their own life after having discovered their unknown risks. Uh, a lot of people are saying, hey doc, I took your tests. I took this, uh, uh, and they're not tests you buy from me, it's tests that you get from your local lab. 
you just watch and see what you need to be doing. It's uh, an oral glucose tolerance test. It's something that's very, very important. Uh, even more important or even better would be an insulin survey where you get insulin at the time of those glucose tolerance tests. And we get feedback all the time. Hey, doc, I took your test. I didn't have prediabetes. I had full-blown diabetes. And my doctor did not know that. My doctor had been telling me I don't have any problems. So you see that all the time. And by the way, then they'll often say, hey, doc, you saved my life. You know, that's what we're in this for. We're in this to save lives and we're saving a lot of them. If you'd like to help us, you know, contribute to the channel. Uh, if you'd like to help us get it out there and you don't want to contribute, that's fine. Just take one of those, uh, take one of the videos and, and place it in, a, in another um, social media like Facebook or Twitter or, you know, one of those Instagram, one of those other things. So here's a, some recent previous topics. OGTT or the oral glucose tolerance test that I just talked about or insulin survey. Are you getting ready to get one? Watch this first about carb loading. I, I'd had a patient just yesterday telling me, hey, I didn't know that you really don't have to do the carb loading. You know, this patient was a patient that hated doing the carb loading. In fact, I've had many patients saying, look, um, Eating is, has addictive behavioral components to it. We all know that. In fact, those are the biggest issues, some of the biggest problems with our health behavior. The most important health behavior is how and what we eat and how much. And again, uh, many of us have addictions, myself included. I've struggled with sweets addictions my whole life. And I went downgraded some of that sweets addiction and traded it off for something worse, a bread addiction or a bread habit. I wasn't quite so addicted to breads, but, you know, I grew up in the Southeast United States, the land of sweet tea uh, and blackberry cobbler. It's a pie made out of blackberries, not just the blackberries though, some, a lot of crusts made out of flour and a whole lot of sugar, a, a place where you had to have desserts for every meal. So uh, now here's the thing. Uh, the definitive test for this most common problem that we have, the root cause, that's insulin resistance, prediabetes or diabetes. The best test for that is not even hemoglobin A1C. We can talk about that later if, if you have questions on it. Uh, it's the glucose tolerance test or insulin survey. Now it's been the prevailing wisdom, wisdom, maybe I should say urban myth on the internet for five or six years, maybe even a decade, that you have to do carb loading on an OG, before you do an OGTT or an, or an insulin survey. If you don't, some of the myths say, well, you'll get a false positive. If you don't, other myths will say, oh, if you don't, you'll get a false negative. We actually looked at the data last week. And again, it might surprise you. Uh, other things we've talked about, are statins causing your muscle pain? Again, you know, you might get a few haters on the reality behind that question, the evidence on that question. And you know you're going to get a lot of haters when uh, you're talking about the fourth jab, the vaccines, yes or no. But again, we had a lot of people that really wanted to have some thoughts, some impressions. So that's what we did. Now, uh, here's the thing. Uh, this information, uh, there are three courses that are core to uh, helping you understand how to protect your life. Like I said before, it's really clear, even in what's supposed to be the best medical system in the world, over two thirds of docs don't know how to, un how to diagnose the underlying metabolic problem causing the vast majority of cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, even uh, Alzheimer's. They just don't know how to diagnose it. It's the number one cause of kidney disease and blindness. So guess what? Um, it, it's, you know, that old sales term that's very difficult. It's harsh, but it's reality. Caveat emptor. Buyer beware. The patient beware. Make sure that you know basics about insulin resistance. 
and along with that, cardiovascular inflammation and plaque. And if you have any problem getting those, if you can't afford the 15 to 50 bucks, uh, let Michelle know. We'll see if we can figure out a way to get that to you for free. Within just a couple of hours, you'll know more than your primary care doctor, or at least two thirds of you will, uh, know more than your primary care doctor about how to protect your health. Um, I'm going to skip over those last two uh, slides and just make a comment. We usually have an intro slide about the prevention myths book. <clears throat> People think that, you know, it's a very common conversation. Hey doc, my, um, my uncle had a heart attack and died. And I'm a lot like my uncle. This is a conversation. This is not me saying, this is not a real conversation that I've had, but you hear it all the time. I'm a lot like that family member that had that heart attack. Could we just do a stress test and make sure I'm not going to have a heart attack? Well, here's the problem. A stress test is not going to prevent a heart attack. Well, you say, well, that's okay. I just, I can prevent it if I, if I get warning of it. A stress test is not going to give you a warning about a heart attack. The simple reason behind it is, uh, a stress test is only going to be positive if half the blood flow in your heart arteries is blocked. Half the flow is blocked. The flow is blocked by 50%. Two thirds of heart attacks occur in people that have plaque, but not 50% flow blockage. So <clears throat> as you'll see, if you've not spent time on this channel, we get really geeky in terms of the science, the evidence, because we try to be very different from a typical uh, YouTube show, a typical internet show. We focus on the facts. We focus on the evidence. And the evidence can get kind of messy sometimes. So that's okay. We're going to focus on the facts. That's what that Prevention Myths book is about. We've gotten, been getting a lot more positive feedback than I expected. And why is that? I sort of thought it was sort of dry, uh, like some of the stuff that we cover, maybe sort of boring, but again, we keep, keep getting feedback that maybe a little bit, but not really like you thought. So uh, we have gotten so many topics piled up in terms of our queue uh, that we've started doing more of a system where we plan, uh, we'll do two topics in a day. We're going to do two topics today. The first topic is a quick one slide um, mini topic, and then we'll do the, uh, the major topic. So let's do with the one slide, the mini topic. It has to do with Fitbit. It has to do with pulmonary disease, and it has to do with preventing um, health problems. So how can a Fit, what's the association between those three? Well, here, look at it. Daily step counts were associated with hospitalization risk in pulmonary artery hypertension. Patients with pulmonary artery hypertension uh, often have decreased exercise capacity. Here's the problem. Pulmonary artery hypertension is usually a significant, maybe even severe form of heart failure. We're not going to get too deep into discussing the intricacies of that those actually confuse a lot of doctors and there's no need to go there. But what we do want to know is that for cardiovascular and lung disease, cardiovascular disease um, and its impact on lung disease, mostly cardiovascular disease, there is a significant relationship between exercise and whether or not you end up in the hospital. So, as I said, it's a uh, this is a reduction in right ventricle uh, function. That's about as deep as we're going to get in terms of explaining the background. The authors of this study performed a study where they, they asked participants to wear a Fitbit Charge 3 device for a two-week run-in period. Um, an echocardiogram was then performed. 42 patients uh, participated in this study and an average of 4,709 steps was recorded. Lower step counts were associated with higher risk of hospitalization. 
Yeah, if you thought I was going to say higher step counts ended up in hospitalization, no, it's it's what you would expect. Get out there and walk. If you can do that, you're much le- uh, less likely to end up in the hospital. And guess what? Is that a surprise to anybody? It shouldn't be. You know, here's the bigger question. How much of that is just a participation bias? And do you know what I mean by participation bias? If you're curious about that, uh, ask me in the, in the Q&A. But we'll get to the Q&A in a few minutes. First, let's uh, get the water ball, Gilbert, and we'll go into today's major topic. So thank you, Gilbert. And the major topic for today is just going to be a series of minor or short stories. And again, as I said before, the names have been changed to protect privacy. This is Anna's story. Anna said she came to me with a, um, a mysterious heart disease in her family. She was a 56 year old Mexican American. She came to one of our, um, our programs. She told us her family had had significant heart attack risk, brothers, uncles, father. uh, And she said, and I'll tell you this, uh, we're Mexican American. We know we have increased heart risk just being Mexican American, but this is beyond that. There's something going on in our family. Her father, as I said, her father, both brothers, other family members had had heart attacks in their fifties. Family cholesterol values seemed to be fine, so doctors were mystified. Her CIMT indicated an arterial age of 64 at a time that she was in her mid-50s. Her LDL at that time was 71, so again, doctors were mystified. Her LP little a was 281. Now, you can say this next statement is, uh, well, let me just read the, the script and I'm going to go off topic, off script for a second. It's, it's present in less, uh, LP little a, that, that value is present in less than 20% of the population. That's true. And it can go higher and higher and higher. Uh, we've had a couple of people on, uh, one of our patients and friends named Joe, uh, came on and he had had a uh, an LP little a value gosh seven or eight hundred given what I do for a living you might guess I've had LP little a uh, patients in some significant subpopulations Uh, there's a Canadian a French Canadian subpopulation that has very significant LP little a in fact to the extent that they will have uh, what's called Uh, aortic valve calcification. And yes, Joe Riley, who had appeared on the show and told us his story, had had some problems in his family uh, and himself with some aortic calcification. So I'm going down this path. If you've never heard of LP little a, let's stop for a second and talk about it. Uh, Did you ever hear of the show, The Biggest Loser? Uh, there was uh, a trainer. Now I'm having a senior moment, Bob Harper. Bob Harper was the trainer on The Biggest Loser. He was in his early 50s, had a heart attack one day when he was training. He was uh, in great shape physically. And it was like, oh my gosh, what happened? So he comes out that week and says, it's LP little a. Again, if you're still, if you've never heard of it, one of your questions might be, well, so what is that? And then he said the next statement. I got it from my mom. Well, LP little a is a genetic issue. It's a thing that we that many doctors have known about for a long time. But since the medical community didn't know there was much they could do for it, they didn't even, you know, they didn't talk to patients about it. They didn't look for it. Here's what it is. LP little a is actually a genetic variation of LDL. It's a genetic variation that has its own significant unrelated risk 
of cardiovascular disease. It has some, once you start getting into the molecular view of LP little a, it has a thing called uh, uh, Kringle repeats. It's, you know, re repeated sections of proteins over and over and over again that hang off of the LDL particle, the LP little a particle. And some people have said, you know, and I've in the past often wondered, well, does that, does that, appendage of Kringle repeats, does that cause it to hook onto the intima layer? Does it cause something else? That may be a possibility. There's actually more research recently indicating that for some reason it appears to uh, have more of an attraction for oxidized LDL. Bottom line is we're not completely sure how and why uh, uh, what the molecular mechanism is for LP little a risk, but we know that it's there. And again, I'll go back and I'll say, uh, most doctors aren't even aware of it because most doctors haven't even looked. Well, things did change with Bob Harper. It became much more of a prime time thing. People began to learn about it, began to become aware of it. Something else happened too that often changes awareness especially in the United States, they developed a set of drugs. They're called anti-sense drugs. And those anti-sense drugs have actually had a huge impact on the LP little a levels. You don't see L the anti-sense drugs out there just yet, but you do see a lot of clinical trials. And you will probably see them in most of our lifetime come out, and they'll probably be expensive, just like some of the other high-tech genetically oriented drugs have been. Uh, like the PCSK9s, if you've heard of that. So let's go back to the script. Let's go back to Anna's story. Let's go back to what happened with her. She also had risk for prediabetes. Uh, she had uh, not, not significantly overweight, but she knew she could lose a pound, a few pounds. She started on niacin after discovering for the first time that she had an LP little a problem. And then she went back to her family and said, guys, we need to start testing for this. And sure enough, they started finding that risk factor. They started doing something about it. I talked about niacin. There's, a major, there's been a major debate within medical communities about niacin. One of the, uh, the study authors that people, doctors often quote to say niacin doesn't work came on and he said, this, this is very unfortunate. This is in fact a disaster because doctors are going to misinterpret the results of my study to think that niacin doesn't help for LP little a, and we know it does. So again, another one of those stories involving the research around cardiovascular risk. Now this is another interesting story uh, you, you're only going to have heart attack and stroke risk if you're uh, overweight and you have a lot of body fat, right? That's what most of us think. And there are good reasons for that. Body fat is a major, major issue. And it happens more as we age into it, that middle age bulge. We think that that's, you know, just unsightly, but, or maybe pudgy or gives you a dad bod. Mm, that's not just the problem. The problem is that uh, body fat is not what we used to think. We used to think it was an inert energy storage tissue. It's not inert at all. It's an endocrine tissue, and it releases hormone-related chemicals that cause insulin resistance which in turn causes all the other problems we talked about. So body fat is a very important issue, but guess what? Thin people can get problem, cardiovascular risk problems as well. Jim, for example, was an example. He, uh, his BMI was 20.5. He was very muscular, very little body fat. At age 53, he'd already had two stents. So this wasn't a body fat issue. We did, uh, actually, we did some OGTT uh, and looked for uh, insulin resistance. We thought maybe, you know, he was one of these thin people that had some. No, we didn't see significant in insulin resistance with him either. Uh, well, you know, maybe it was FH. Maybe there was some LDL issues. No, 
LDL issues, uh, values had been typical. Well, maybe there was a lot of plaque. Mm, not so much, not really that much plaque at all. A little bit, but not, not much. Pre-stent angiograms did show some plaque though. So still he had not shown a lot of plaque on CIMT. He did have some plaque on uh, pre-stent angiograms and he'd had symptoms. Because of uh, Jim's body habitus, not complexion, but because of the fact that he was so tall and so thin, he was like 6'4", or is like 6'4", um, Marfan's uh, syndrome was considered. He actually had uh, more than one workup for Marfan's. Uh, Marfan's folks, uh, patients are usually tall, thin. You know, you hear about that with the basketball players. Um, you know, you hear about that. You heard about that with uh, Lynn Bias. Lynn Bias's story got, um, for those of you who know it, it also involved drugs and some other stuff. Um, but the typical Marfan's uh, syndrome patient is also a cardiac issue, but not the typical cardiovascular issue that, uh, that we're used to talking about on this channel. With Marfan syndrome, what you get is some risk for aortic aneurysm, you know, splitting of the tissues of the aorta. That's the concern that you have with Marfan's. So yes, it does uh, <clears throat> predispose people to premature death, um, but Mar Marfan's syndrome had been ruled out. And in fact, at the time of the writing of the book, Marfan syndrome had been ruled out not once, not twice, but three times. Now, <clears throat> other related genetic issues like Stickler's syndrome, it's a Marfanoid like uh, connective tissue issue, was, uh, that was considered again, nothing. His mother had had a similar history, but let's go back to continuing to look around at other potential issues. His LP to little a was 300. And after niacin, it improved to 200 and continued to improve. Now, one of the things that people think about with niacin is what it, um, niacin and LP little a is that, uh, well, it doesn't really take it down to the normal values, 10 or 20. I can tell you from watching people with LP little a and taking niacin, it's typical uh, if you get a, re a reaction to uh, niacin, it's usually like you see with, with Jim, uh, uh, a quarter to a, two th uh, to a third decrease. I've seen much larger decreases in some people. But that's one of the reasons that causes confusion. So people see you don't get a full decline, a full wipeout of the LP little a value. So it must not be working. I can tell you, we monitor cardiovascular inflammation and we monitor um, soft plaque, things that are not monitored in a typical medical environment. And we typically will see a 30% decrease in LP little a and an association with improvement on cardiovascular inflammation and uh, soft plaque. So uh, again, the stories are not what you might think, not what you might always be looking for. Now this one, a little bit more typical, except it was a female, Angie. Angie was the 50-year-old wife of a physician. She expected to have no, no cardiovascular problems, but she felt like her husband, the physician, was had some problems and he really needed to quit denying them and start dealing with them. So she agreed to come see me along with her husband. As often happens in those kind of situations, the wife got a surprise, something that she didn't like to hear, but she needed to. So she expected to have no cardiovascular problems. Her CIMT came back showing significant aging of those arteries. She was focused on her own Hashimoto's disease. That's an inflammatory disease, which we can talk about a little bit later if somebody wants to raise questions about it. She also had some GI symptoms, 
quite often GI symptoms are associated with inflammatory disease as well. And I will tell you, well, I'll hold, I'll hold on the next comment until we get to the next bullet. She was not aware. The same problem causing her illnesses was also increasing her cardiovascular risk. Haptoglobin 2 and its precursor, zonulin, were causing multiple inflammatory diseases, ranging from cardiovascular disease to leaky gut to Hashimoto's. Really? Yeah. And if you haven't seen or heard of all of that, again, welcome to the channel and welcome to the world of managing cardiovascular risk. Angie did have prediabetes. You know, cardiovascular Cardiovascular risk is rarely a single risk issue. So Angie came to the table with some thyroid issues, which is a risk for cardiovascular disease, even at age 50, some um, inherent cardiovascular risk, which she was surprised about, didn't know that she had, some gastrointestinal problems, which turned out to be related to haptoglobin 2. So again, all these related to a molecular metabolism problem that, again, folks typically do not look for. Her BMI was 29. 30 is a level of obesity. So 20, uh, 25, anything over 25 is a real significant issue. I've got, I've got some men who say, well, wait a minute. No, I'm very muscular. Uh, I need, it's muscle, it's not fat, so therefore I'm healthy. If it is muscle, and not fat, that's true. Muscle is very important and very healthy. Um, however, think about it just a minute. For that, the, that typical male my, that says this is, this is muscle, this BMI issue I have is muscle, think about this. Arnold Schwarzenegger had a BMI of 30 when he won the Mr. Olympia contest. So yes, you can have a BMI as high as 30 and not really have a body fat issue. But if that's the case, you're going to look like Arnold when he won Mr. Olympia. So most of us don't look like that. Weight loss was going to be a significant part of Angie's journey back to health. There's just no question. After her lifestyle modifications, she dropped her BMI. She dropped her fast. Along with that, she dropped her fasting glucose and her CIMT actually started to improve. It showed decreases in arterial wall inflammation. She re significantly reduced her risk of heart attack and stroke. Jake, FH versus lean mass hyper responder. You know, I get these calls and the, it, patients will be panicked. They'll say, hey, doc, you know, um, I decided to try this low carb diet. And when I did, my LDL just shot way up. Well, um, guess what? That can happen sometimes. And you used to think that it was just an internet uh, description, one of those uh, erroneous internet uh, urban myths. No, it's real. It's called lean mass hyper responder. I have one. I had one of the uh, um, the major guys for that on there, uh, uh, Dave Feldman. A few, oh gosh, a few months ago now, uh, and we're going to be taking some snippets from Dave and my uh, Dave and my discussion uh, a few months ago, and and putting those out there this week. Um, what's going on? It's not completely clear why that happens. Is there a, how do we know when a patient who has these LDL levels 200 or above, how do we know if that's a lean mass hyperresponder situation or familial hypercholesterolemia? Well, there's a couple of ways to know. One of them is if you're on a higher carb diet and you like 150, 200 grams of carbs and you still have an, uh, an LDL, 180 or above, then it's probably FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, both of these concepts, even if FH, very, very few primary care doctors are aware of it. 
So again, I'll, I'll go back to my original statement about this slide. I'll typically, I'll often get these calls where somebody will say, hey doc, I went on this low carb diet uh, to improve my cardiovascular status. And what happened was my LDL shot out the roof. It went way up. Now my doctor, my cardiologist, my primary care doctor, they're saying, oh, you got to go on a statin or you got to really increase your statins. And they start getting into this battle with statins and LDL levels, trying to bring that back down. Meanwhile, for many of them, the uh, low carb diet is driving that LDL level. So people are not aware of that. Their doctors are not aware of it. And they continue to um, just respond inappropriately to the, to the detriment of patients. Now let's go back to Jake and, the, and the, uh, the story here. Jake had had cholesterol problems detected when he was 19 years old. His dad had had a triple bypass and his dad had had huge uh, LDL levels as well. Jake was thin, very athletic. Um, his LDL was always above 200. At age 39, he had a positive calcium score. So um, Jake is one of those folks, um, I strongly suspected FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. After uh, discovering our channel, he, um, he came on, he actually shared his story. He did a couple of videos with us. Um, he realized that this is his quote. I realized I needed more than lifestyle. I had familial hypercholesterolemia. And I was probably also a lean mass hyper responder because every time I dropped my carbs, my LDL shot out the roof even higher. He stopped full keto and just changed to more of a gentler, low carb diet. As he did, he became much more comfortable with his LDL, LDL values and his cardiovascular risk. Jeff. Jeff was an executive. He was like always worried. He'd heard about people having heart attacks young and he was, he was a health nut. He did not want to have any problems. He was 40 years old, executive CEO of a significant company, ultra marathon runner. He was a little bit worried about some vague symptoms he developed, especially while running. Uh, it happened a few weeks in a row. Despite these symptoms, he declined inflammation testing, cardiovascular inflammation testing. He, was, um, he saw a cardiologist, and the cardiologist said what cardiologists almost always say. Well, let's do a stress test. He did a stress test, and again, he's an ultra. at the time that this happened, he was an ultramarathon runner. So guess what? He passed the stress test with flying colors. He didn't know about arterial inflammation. He didn't know about prediabetes. He didn't know the Tim Russert story. And yes, we had some issues there. We found uh, some risk. He did end up coming to see me a little bit later and told me this first part of the story. And yes, he did uh, have some uh, insulin resistance. We, start, we discovered that. We started dealing with it, and he's in a much happier, much more comfortable place at this point. Still running ultra marathons. So there you go. That's the content for today. And Gilbert, if you'll give us the transition, we'll go into Q&A. So, actually, I need to change my screen a little bit. Okay, we've got, oh, dang, we have, I, I thought this was going to be a light day, but we've got a lot of questions. Let me, let's see if we can get started with them. Vagabond show, Sojourner, can't, uh, he, he's talking about a quote that he hears on this channel quite often. You can't exercise, supplement, or medicate your way out of a bad diet. You also can't stent or bypass your way out of a diet problem either. Vagabond goes on to say, after having a good year, I took my foot off the gas pedal. I began snacking and eating carbs, and I gained 15 pounds. All of my markers were horrific. 
Ouch. But here's the thing. In my experience, I mean, it's a great thing to share this kind of stuff, Vagabond, because here's one of the things that I tend to see over and over and over again. People start realizing they have risk. They start realizing, it, as in most cases, that it's associated with uh, body fat. It's associated with weight problems, which are in turn associated with um, often aging, but uh, often a whole lot of food uh, addiction related issues. And uh, they make some changes. They say, okay, I'm going right to the wall. I am never eating another carb, et cetera, et cetera. And then they, you know, they do great for two, three, four months. Something happens in their life, like an illness in it with a family member where they have to be in the hospital a lot and can't co control their diet or a holiday like Christmas. And as we mentioned earlier on, occasionally uh, some people have fallen off the wagon with just doing that three day carb load prior to an OGTT or an insulin survey. All of these things can cause you to fall off the wagon and start eating carbs, start eating more and start gaining weight. Well, you know, we're not talking about the speed of getting to your weight loss goals. We're not talking about um, how much and how fast you can get there. This is a real tortoise or the hare issue. We're, this is not a sprint. This is not even a marathon because depending on how fast you are, you know, if you're at world record times, sub two hour marathons, that's one thing. But most of us mortals that have actually run marathons are three, four, five, or six hours. We're not talking about that either. We're talking about a permanent life change. So once you start talking about a permanent life change, it's much, much less an issue of speed, and it's much more an issue of getting back up when you get knocked down. You fall off that wagon, you fall in a ditch, how well can you pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and get back in the ring? So I mixed a few metaphors there. I hope you, uh, hope you can, um, can uh, to uh, tolerate that. Bobby Ocampo from uh, the Philippines. Mabu Hey, Mabu Hey to you as well. Bobby, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Vagabond Sojourner continued back on the wagon. Omad, four days a week. For those of you who don't know what Omad means, it's one meal a day, two meals, three days per week, no snacking or carbs over 30 per day. In other words, not more, limiting to 30 carbs per day. Once I lose, lose the 15 pounds, I will weigh and fully expect numbers to drastically improve. They probably will. Again, body fat really messes up our metabolism. And when we look at the biomarkers that we talk about on this channel, it's really, really clear that uh, it's a big, big deal in terms of health. And guess what? This whole concept of you can have a heart attack in your 60s and be surprised out of it, like a, like a bolt of lightning out of the blue sky. We've, we've done videos on that too. Uh, there were some German studies that said, uh, when you look at lightning, you know, you hear that term, that Hollywood term, like a bolt out of the blue. Bolts of lightning don't come out of empty blue sky. Bolts of lightning come out of cloudy sky, stormy sky, uh, rainy skies, and guess what? The same thing happens with heart attacks. You go in, you, know, you start knowing the biomarkers that Vagamon Sojourner is referring to, and you start tracking those, uh, those biomarkers, you're not going to be surprised by a heart attack coming totally out of the blue. So... Uninsurable. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you, Uninsurable. That's an interesting name. Kathy Topia, Roswell, New Mexico. Looks like a few aliens there. For those of you who don't know, that's uh, Roswell is, uh, is famous for a place called Area 51, which is supposed to be uh, 
a big, big area for sighting aliens. Tanner Bruin. I was an earlier, I was an early purchaser of the book. While you often self-critique it as being a little bit dry, if you get a bad cal calcium score, it reads like a spy thriller. Thank you so much. That's, uh, I love your sense of humor. Uh, yeah, it may be a little bit dry, but if you got a positive calcium score, it becomes a exciting even. It was a guide for me through a dark time. Thank you so much, Tanner. I really appreciate that comment. Neil P., I had someone in my family who is thin, vegetarian, has a night shift job, and is not sedentary, and had four blockages at age 67. Thank you for sharing that. And I hear that, and I think, hmm. I would so much like to have an OGTT for that individual, or better yet, an insulin survey. You know, it's interesting. I had a, a what, mid-30s-year-old uh, female, a friend of a friend of a friend, uh, came to me, and she was, um, she had mentioned to uh, uh, her mom and others, you know, I'm just tired a lot. She had a, a child that was, what, less than a year old, maybe a year old, two years, um, very much in the infant stage. And um, I, she actually uh, hooked up with some of our folks at the, uh, the Alabama clinic, got a, a, an insulin survey, and numbers looked okay. A uh, little bit of ins obvious clear insulin resistance in terms of the OGTT part, but they got insulin values and the insulin values came back over twice, actually four times a healthy level. So we're talking about a young person. We're talking about a female. We're talking about OGTT values that were not that bad, but insulin values that were not good. So again, be very uh, aware of your ability to metabolize carbohydrates. It's far more uh, common than people think. You know, you look at the CDC sites, the CDC in the U.S., and you can, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a common fashion now to criticize the CDC. You know, they're humans. They've done a lot of good work. They've made a lot of mistakes. So I'm overall a fan and... Pardon me for making what shouldn't be a political comment. The bottom line, though, is that they've said a third of people uh, age 60 and older have prediabetes in the U.S. Well, the reality is that's old numbers, and they still haven't updated their own website. The reality coming from UCLA is that it's not a third, it's a half, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't start as we age into our 60s. It starts at the age 30. But that's for just California, right? So we're, the rest of us who don't live in California are lucky. Those are the guys that a whole lot of them have this risk. Uh, come on, let's get real. No, it's all of us. And guess what? There are some genetic uh, variations. I won't get into those right now, but uh, there have been other studies, one of them in the JAMA, uh, Journal of the AMA, um, uh, network articles indicating that, yes, that was true. This, the, this problem doesn't start in our 60s. It's, you start seeing it in our 30s. And no, it's not one third, it's one half. So it brings up that old Clint Eastwood movie. Are you feeling lucky? My guess is your, Neil P, is that your family member who's thin, vegetarian, had a night shift job at age 67, also has prediabetes or full-blown diabetes until proven otherwise. Bart Robinson, I agree, Tanner, and greetings, everyone. Thank you, Bart, for uh, the greetings and your interest. Neil P. could be living in the New Jersey area and low vitamin D levels, but we were all surprised. Bob Knob, that's plandemic. Hmm, not going to comment. Uh, Becky Quick, good morning. Just curious, how many carbs do you eat in a day or per meal? I try to keep, you know, it's a good question. And <clears throat> I try to keep a little bit of a, of a gentler uh, low-carb diet. 
I keep saying that I try to keep them to about a hundred grams per day. When I actually start, that's probably true when I'm not, when I'm traveling and I don't have as much control over my diet. When I am at home, not traveling, or especially if I'm not going out to eat, it's actually much lower than that. The other thing I'll bring up in terms of carbs though, is um, this issue of glycemic carbs. One of the major frustration points is that um, the government groups, FDA, have said, look, you've got to label um, uh, oh, I'm having a, I, I, you've got to label fiber as a carb. Technically, biochemically, fiber is a carb. But it doesn't impact your blood sugar. It does not cause this problem. It doesn't cause insulin release. So, you know, things that are, quote, high, uh, high carb because they're high fiber, cauliflower, asparagus, um, Brussels sprouts, all those things you can eat, all of that you want to eat. And yes, it's got carbs, but those are not carbs that should count. Do not count fiber-related carbs in your diet. In fact, there's a whole bunch of evidence that would indicate the more fiber in your diet, the better. Oh, my friend, David Mainz. I like that Vietnam War Memorial example. You know why he likes that? I'm going to give myself up here. I got that from my friend, David Mainz. So no wonder you like it, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the comment. And thank you most of all for letting me unabashedly take credit and plagiarize your quote about the Vietnam War Memorial. E.T. himself, been eating clean for some time, and yesterday I had three slices of the best pizza in town. Uh-oh, result has been toxic for 24 hours. Okay, now, you know, that's one of the things that happens. We don't realize that we sort of get used to eating a high-carb diet, and when we go low-carb and we get used to going low-carb, the... Um, we start getting into problems sometimes. You feel bloated, you get headachey. Uh, you get a bunch of weird feelings when you start eating carbs and you've been hiding from them. Marco Holklochner. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Good morning, day, evening. Well, good morning or day or evening to you too, Marco. Where are you from? Leo Acapulco. Leo's been on a few times or has shared a few times. Very important information. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. There's a lot that we can do about our health. There is absolutely no question about that. Again, thanks, Leo. Bart Robinson lives in South Jersey. Vitamin D level is 80. Last blood work supplements with 4,000 international units. You know, it's a good point. Several points about vitamin D. Uh, you used to have it used to be um, here. So vitamin D originally, 100 years ago, we thought was just a preventative uh, against rickets, which made your bones bow, bow out. Um, then they saw that, I mean, and, and these were people that had very severe vitamin D deficiencies. So they said, look, you can avoid that with levels of vitamin D in the teens and 20s. Um, so that was originally the goal. And then they said, okay, maybe 40. This was not five years ago. This is not 10 years ago. At least 15 to 20 years ago, there was some stuff that started coming out, evidence indicating that what we thought were uh, good, healthy vitamin D levels were probably still a little bit low. You've had this debate back and forth. Uh, that lasted for about five years, and then it became clear you do need to have higher levels it was interesting that uh, debate died down until the pandemic, uh, the recent pandemic happened. And um, even the, the larger centers, Hopkins, where I used to work, Harvard, some of the others started saying, yes, the evidence is coming out very, very clear. You do need higher levels of vitamin D. And in fact, people with low levels of vitamin D were succumbing to cytokine storm much more often 
if they got a COVID infection. So thank you so much, Bart, for sharing. Uh, well, let me bring up a couple of other points while I'm thinking about it. So I see uh, couples all the time. I mentioned a couple a few minutes ago where the, the husband and wife come in to see me. And it's interesting. I'll often see a wife who uh, is indoors all the time. She said, I never go out and neither one of them supplement. The husband is out playing golf a lot. And the husband has vitamin D deficiency and the wife doesn't. Now, there are a couple of common reasons for that. One is that there's some genetic variation in the way that you metabolize vitamin D. So be aware of that. And yes, you have to get, uh, you have to test. You have to make sure that you get a test and understand it. The, um, the other component is there does seem to be some significant impact with uh, body fat. Again, you see vitamin D3 is a, um, fat soluble vitamin. And I tend to see this. I haven't seen studies. I haven't seen a lot of evidence, uh, hard evidence, but I'm just giving you the impressions that I see as a, as a doctor who deals with this issue quite often. People will get into a, a fat loss mode and their vitamin D levels start going up without changing their supplementation. So here are a few rules. Number one, don't say, okay, I live in Florida. I live below that uh, vitamin D sunshine line. So I don't have to supplement. Don't depend on that. Uh, sunshine. Um, yes, it does help a whole lot of people, but the bottom line is, uh, tests don't guess, at least in terms of this issue. The other bottom line is I've never seen anybody get toxic levels from five, uh, 5,000 international units or lower. I did talk to a patient this week who had a history suggestive of that. That was the first time I've seen it and I've never seen it in the scientific literature. Now, why am I talking about that? Yes, vitamin D can be given in toxic levels. I've also shared uh, and actually had one of my patients uh, come on board. She came to me um, from another provider uh, doing a, a, some other types of work. That provider had given her some uh, suggestions and a prescription for vitamin D. There are common uh, prescriptions for vitamin D using uh, 25, even 50,000 international units. Those uh, preparations are meant to be given once a week. And that was the way this provider had recommended it. But, you know, you hear something, well, if, it's, if something's good in a little bit, a whole lot of, has got to be a lot better, right? She was taking it daily. And she came to me with a, what was it, a blood value of like 130 or something? Uh, there have been deaths associated with blood uh, vitamin D3 levels of 130. So be careful about, uh, about vitamin D. Make sure you're aware of it. Uh, the, the, typical, the typical best way to approach it is have some suspicion that you're likely to be deficient if you're not, if you're not um, supplementing. It's safe to start with 5,000, uh, but get a test. 5,000 international units, not milligrams. Those are different numbers, different times. Uh, 5,000 international units or less. After about a month of that, get a blood value, test again, and shoot for a level between 60 and 90. Don't go over 100. A lot of people, you know, I've had this discussion on shows in the past, and some people came on very cavalier saying, oh, no, 100's great. No, it's not. Look at the science. It's, I, I didn't make the science up. I'm just reporting it. Thank you so much, Bart. You brought up a great topic. Don Stewart, hello from Gallatin, Tennessee. Gallatin near Nashville. Listen to you every Wednesday. 78 years old. Had insulin resistance. I've done a complete lifestyle change. Lost 40 pounds, 45 pounds. Hope I'm on the right road. It is hard to imagine that you wouldn't be on the right road after losing that kind of weight. Thank you so much, Don. I appreciate the, uh, the interest. Mezzanine is, on, Mezzanine is often commenting on here. Thank you, Mezzanine. Barnett Ray, or Barnett Roy, your advice has helped me lose 75 pounds. Uh, 79 with many. No, hmm. 
Well, didn't understand those last few words, but thank you so much, Barnett. That's a big, big deal. That's life-saving. You know, a lot of folks do give me credit, and I do appreciate that, and it's a lot of fun to get a lot of credit. But I'm not doing the work, guys. Barnett, for example, you did the work. You did the hard part. So thank you so much for what you're doing. You know, when you do what I do for a living, it is incredibly gratifying to see people actually do the work and actually have such a positive impact on their health. Thank you again. I, I cannot tell you the impact that that kind of weight loss has on health. There's the, the science, the evidence is just unchangeable. I'm going to digress for a second. I, I realize I've got this sun coming over. Um, it is what it is. We're down at the Alabama um, at the Alabama offices, and this is what we've got. So. Um, I, I hope you can uh, tolerate the, the poor lighting. Bobby Ocampo, if diet, diet, diet is the major solution, our problem is the nutrition guidelines. Oh, don't get me started on that. We copy the standard American diet in the Philippines. And you do. And as you know, uh, Bobby, and others know as well, a, a large portion, most of my production team, the channel production team, like Gilbert, live in the Philippines. And I've had, uh, I've done some work with um, some of the previous staff members. Uh, one of them ha was very young, in his uh, 20s, had significant diabetes related problems. And yes, his diet consisted of pineapple, guava, other fruits, high glucose fruits, and guess what? Rice. You know, just carb after carb after carb. So, mm. yeah. Barnett Roy, God bless, lost 75 pounds. Oh, at 79 years old. Thank you so much, Barnett. Wow, incredible. Uh, many issues, 215 to, oh, 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 you went from 215 pounds to 142. Incredible. You lost, you didn't lose one of you, but you came pretty close. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing, Barnett. Uh, Brendan Lenane, regret I followed a damaging five-a-day UK campaign, which strongly suggested more fruit is better. Even included banana chips and ketchup. Oh. You know, the problem with those, the biggest problem, and I have to say it before I finish your comment, Brendan. People say, well, Doc, what, what diet do you want? Uh, what, what diet do you recommend? And as you can see, I tend to lean towards low carb, but here's the real issue. I don't care so much about paleo, keto, low carb, high carb, uh, plant based, except I want to make sure that people know what they can healthily eat. And by far, as I said a few minutes ago, over half of us at age 30 cannot help, cannot eat carbs with good health. That's the reality. So first of all, know the situation, understand the situation. And again, you'll see it. Most of us cannot eat carbs and still be healthy. Um, so yeah, that's why I end up leaning towards more of a low carb diet because most human bodies cannot tolerate it. There's actually even some evidence. Um, you know, there are a couple of, of endocrinologists who have weighed in on this in this area, Bob Lust, uh, Robert Lustig and um, Bob Ludwig. Similar names, similar uh, approach, similar endocrinology background. Both of you know, one, both of them are working in academic areas. Uh, Lustig, I think, at UC San Francisco. Ludwig at uh, Harvard, and both of them have written books on the dangers and perils of carbs and why. Insulin is such a dangerous uh, hormone for most of us and why we need to focus on that. They go into details on it. The reason I went down that bunny hole is that Bob Ludwig has done a lot of research. He has actually shown that even those of us who don't have significant insulin resistance, there is some significant risk associated with eating high carb diets. Let me repeat that. He's done research which indicates that even those of us without significant insulin resistance, 
are creating some risk as we eat these high carb diets. Now let's go back to Brendan's comment. Damaging uh, regret following the damaging five a day UK campaign focusing on uh, more fruit, banana chips, ketchups. Now he's on, now you're on carnivore. No more fat phobia. Oh, good for you. Recent OGTT is 80 and 106. Wow. So I'm assuming that's fasting of 80 and a one hour peak of 106. If that's correct, those are some good numbers. You know, the only next question I would have would be what insulin values got you to 80 fasting and 106 at the peak? ET himself. Cool. Neil P, if it's not the stress test, the calcium score, the cholesterol panel, what is it? Assuming you are not diabetic. I wish I understood that question, Neil. Sorry. Bobby Ocampa, maybe a clinical trial to compare how a low A1C will pass insulin craft test or, or fasting glucose test. Well, Bobby, I, I don't know that you need a clinical trial on this. The American, the AACE, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, have said you shouldn't use a, an A1C to diagnose diabetes. Um, any, and their point is anything that causes a, a, a variation in hemoglobin can cause a variation in, in the A1C. Well, pregnancy causes variation in hemoglobin, uh, genetic variations, sickle trait, uh, thalassemias, all these things cause genetic variations of hemoglobin. Um, Kidney disease, liver disease cause changes in hemoglobin. Anemias cause uh, changes in hemoglobin. And there's another thing which is far more common, and I see it all the time in my practice, people with very low A1Cs, five and a half or lower, or lower than five, with full-blown diabetes. Well, why is that? Because they're not eating carbs on a regular basis. They're keeping their blood sugars 120 or an, and even less, 120 postprandial, because they're not eating carbs. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why you got to be careful depending on an A1C. The, the AACE, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, is right. This perception that A1C is the only way to diagnose diabetes is a problem. Marco, uh, Marco again. Hulk, Hulk Clutcher, the best quote from Ford Brewer. I think I've heard from him on some of his YouTubes. It's not atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. <clears throat> it's metabolic thing. Uh, insulin creating small but inflammatory plaques on the artery wall. Yeah, that's true. That's it's the metabolism. Uh, and thank you for for the quote. Uh, and it's metabolism and the uh, impact on um, inflammation in our artery walls. Bobby Ocampo, Dr. Nadir Ali's lecture is saying that he sees LP little a as a fireman, an indication of inflammation, trying to remove the uh, and trying to remove the inflammation. There's a lot of people that feel that way, and I'm not going to get into a debate on that point. I will say that as I what you know. I'm a doctor and I see, you know, I see a lot of cardiovascular inflammation patients. I do think there is a case for that debate that maybe LP little a is actually trying to put a Band-Aid on inflammatory inflammation problems. Um, but I don't think it's quite that simple, Bobby. Uh, clean slate. Good morning, Dr. Brewer. I, I fast once at the end of the last month's, at the end of the last month's fast, my fasting glucose was 58. After working out, I had a meal with 20 grams of carbs. Well, good for you. You know, I had, I, I have these patients and they'll say, I, I'm stuck at a plateau. I want to get better. You know, I've got, I've had, I've made some major improvements but I still got some more weight I want to lose, or I still have some uh, in, uh, some biomarker problems. What can I do to get me uh, budge me out of this plateau? In fact, I had one of our uh, one of our team members mention that today. 
There are two ways that are very, very common ways, but they are not easy to do, but they are very effective to break out of a plateau. Both of them are lifestyle issues. One of them is exactly what you talk about, clean slate. It's unusual. It's hard, but a prolonged fast can often break that plateau. Prolonged fast meaning more than 24 hours in a fast. The other one that I heard about today, one of our, uh, again, one of our folks said, hey, I just got my BMI less than 25. Made a major, major uh, uh, step of improvement. And I said, well, how'd you do it? And the answer was, well, I'd been doing some aerobics, I'd been doing some diet, but here's what I did. I started doing hills. Hills on the treadmill, hills outside. When you start adding hills to your workout, whether it's on the treadmill, on the bicycle, on the indoor bike, or on the Nordic track, or on anything else, all of a sudden, it's not just you moving your uh, arms and legs. It is you moving your arms and legs against significant resistance. And again, that is a great way to break out of a plateau. ET himself, when synthetic insulin came out, could you explain why many people died from it until the manufacturers reformulated? My dad refused it, and I suppose he was somewhat lucky. Thanks. Well, I'm not an expert in that area. I do know a couple of things, though. There, uh, a, there have always been issues in terms of people understanding exactly how much insulin to use. Um, you know, there's, there were a couple of studies which showed that, it, that, you tended, that researchers tended to uh, kill people, especially when they were in their 75 and 80s and above, uh, by get, when they were going for tighter glucose control, tighter A1C control. And it, was, it puzzled folks, and they started saying, well, you know, tighter glucose, tighter A1C control for... Uh, for people just makes sense, but you kill people doing that. Well, as they got deeper and deeper into the analytics of the studies, what they found was, yes, they were killing people with insulin by trying to make lower blood sugars. Insulin is a, a exogenous or synthetic insulin. Uh, insulins can be, that you inject into your body can be very dangerous. Uh, Audrey Hurley, interested in oral swab. Guess I'm behind. How do I get one? Well, let me just make one other statement. You know, when I say insulin can be dangerous and then walk away, people are going to say, oh, but that's a treatment. It's a medical treatment. How can you possibly say that? It's far safer to use other means of dealing with diabetes. I've got a lot of diabetics that never get, as I said before, uh, never get over a blood sugar of 120, even post-meal. Uh, so... Uh, lifestyle is critical for dealing with diabetes. Um, they've done studies. I mean, there was a New England Journal article, gosh, f over five years ago now, maybe closer to 10, where they, they did a head-to-head -head comparison of a drug, metformin, very simple, easy drug, uh, and fairly harmless, uh, not as dangerous, as nowhere near as dangerous as insulin, but they compared that to very, very mild uh, lifestyle changes. And that, and those lifestyle changes weren't dropping your carbs. They were more like uh, trying to decrease the amount you ate a little bit and trying to walk a few times a week. That was about it. Just that level of lifestyle change was three times more effective than metformin. So more effective than a drug. So again, lifestyle is critical for managing the risks associated with diabetes. Start there and make sure that you've exhausted all of the lifestyle issues. And then when you start having to go to drugs, uh, again, uh, metformin is relatively safe, especially compared to insulin. Be very afraid of insulin. Be, you know, use insulin as a very last resort. 
There's some new drugs, two drug classes now that are that have come out that uh, have been out for a few years. The research is just for benefits and risks for those two drug classes are very, very positive. Decreasing inflammation, decreasing cardiovascular death and risk, which is the big issue for diabetes. Diabetes is not, you know, the diabetes itself is not the problem. It's the impact on cardiovascular risk. Those two drug classes, if you're asking yourself, what are they? The SGLT2s and the GLP1s. What are those? Well, you know, one of the more famous glip ones, a couple of famous ones, Saxenda, uh, Victoza, uh, Ozempic is, a, is one you can actually take by mouth. The other ones, most of the other ones are uh, injectable. Um, what about uh, the other ones, SGLT2s? Uh, Jardians, so Farzaga. So some of those drugs, much, much safer. And so even fewer people should be on outside insulin. Thank you for bringing it up. Audrey Hurley, interested in oral swab. Guess I'm behind. How do I get one? And what will it show about me? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking about with the oral slob, swab. Maybe you're talking about genetics. And gosh, I've got a series of videos on cardiogenetics. Richard Cannon. Doc, hi, Dr. Brewer. Any idea if fluorouracil chemo cream can raise glucose? One week on the Freestyle Libre, also one week on fluorouracil for sun damage and glucose uh, seems very high. Well, number one, check the Libre. I'm a big Libre fan. Um, a lot of people get problems with Libre. And, and let me just give you one thing. Um, <laughs> it happens a lot. I, I had one patient that actually, uh, and, and I'm, people are going to, say, well, you know, all I have to do is complain and Brewer will reimburse stuff. And it's like, I had one patient that got really upset because they had used their Libre and their numbers were really high. And as we continued to talk about what was going on, it turns out they were taking over a gram of vitamin C every day. And, I, and I've, if I've said it once, I've said it dozens of times. I haven't said it thousands of times that... Any, any type of glucose measurement can be uh, impacted by high doses of vitamin C. So anyhow, um, I'll leave that comment and move on. So there's a lot of things that you need to look at in terms of uh, the Libre and whether it's actually working. I'd also make sure that I got a finger stick uh, to, uh, to confirm that. And at some point, if you're doing this a lot and still can, seeing uh, questions and concerns about, about it, you can also just go to Quest or one of the, you know, LabCorp and actually get a, uh, a blood sugar test to, to evaluate and confirm. Now, fluorouracil, I've not seen that associated with high blood sugars. I will say this, though, I'm not surprised. And here's the thing. Both of them are associated with aging. I've got significant... Um, um, skin cancer problems. Uh, I've got some genetic risks there inherited from my mother. Uh, and um, both of these things are very age related. So <clears throat> I hope that helps, Richard. Thank you for bringing it up. Audrey Hurley, behind the curve. How do I get the oral swab? Did blood work? <clears throat> A1C, no, no diabetes. What exactly will the swab show about my health? Audrey, um, not sure what you're talking about in terms of the oral slop. Uh, thumbs up, folks. Thank you, E.T. It's a good point. We've only got one thumb, thumb up, and we've got a lot of questions here. A thumbs up doesn't cost you anything. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Clean slate. At 30 minutes, my glucose is 183. Hmm. That's not good. Checked it twice more to verify. The second one was 133. One, uh, three minutes later. The third was 100, five minutes later. And an hour, it was 98. Two hours, it was 87. My question, can insulin work that fast? No, insulin's not going to drop it in three minutes from 183 to 133. I would go back and reconfirm those numbers. Brendan, every, everything has a role in the body, and sooner or later, we find out what it is. I've seen research that indicates LP little a <clears throat> may help in controlling tumor growth in mice. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point.
point. And I will be interested as well to see how things develop with the evidence around LP little a, Audrey Hurley, Hashimoto's. Vape King, does lycopene help coronary disease? Um, it's minimal at best. Becky Quick, is the stress test with injection instead of with the treadmill uh, dangerous? We talked about that in that course, the stress tail with injection, it's adenosine. And what that adenosine does is cause the heart to beat rapidly. Um, it's not really, it's no more dangerous than, a, than a, uh, a regular stress test, except for this point. The adenosine stress tests are often given for people who have movement problems, which are also associated with things like stroke, which are also associated with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So again, yes, it's associated, but uh, it's associated with danger, but the danger is more associated with pre-existing risk, not the adenosine itself. Bobby Ocampo, Ivar Cummins lectures using GTT, GG, GTT, uh, for insulin resistance. Yep, a lot of people that have watched my channel have watched Ivor's as well. And Ivor, I, Ivor actually, <clears throat> I, I don't watch him uh, so much anymore since the pandemic because he sort of went down that path. But Ivor actually had a great interview with the guy that came up with the insulin survey, Joseph Kraft. So Ivor is a big uh, insulin survey fan, and, and, as am I. Mezzanine, the amount of carbs and glucose consumption by ultra marathoners and marathoners alike is crazy. And they think they're fueling and will burn it off. That was me. Very, very good point. The other thing to think about with a marathoners mezzanine, and I've been an ultra marathoner too. Not very good. I wasn't good at marathon or ultra marathon, but I, you know, that's a different question. Look at the leg, look at the muscle mass of a marathoner. Tiny legs. Muscle mass is protective of cardiovascular disease. So think about it. So you see a lot of the, and in fact, muscle mass active, um, muscle mass tends to, um, to help us avoid the inflammation associated with cardiovascular disease and inability to uh, pull glucose uh, out of the bloodstream and into the muscles. Well, <clears throat> With marathoners, you tend to see their major muscle groups, their biggest muscle groups down in their legs are tiny. They're atrophied. They're small. And that's because of the way they uh, work out. Long, slow distance. Not a lot of burn in the legs, but more slow distance. Um, <clears throat> I am not the first marathoner that's had blood sugar problems. Sam Kemschmidt, Dr. Uh, Maddie Nikki, hi doc, just lost 90 pounds in a year, reversed prediabetes. You will, body fat loss will reverse prediabetes or diabetes. A1C went from six to 4.8, LDL up 107 from 60, the rest perfect, but homocysteine's 20. I learned about homocysteine from you, calcium score zero, thank you so much. So with homocysteine, I had a patient with that just yesterday, it's pretty common. Homocysteine has been, it's sort of like LP little a uh, and some other things that have been noted to have some risk for cardiovascular disease. Homocysteine uh, risk has been off and on. Uh, it, again, is one of those things that came up on the internet and turns out to be uh, some true research once you actually dig deeper. It's something you may have heard of on the internet and that's called poor methylation. You see our uh, oxidation, things that cause our biggest strengths are also often also our biggest weaknesses. And oxidation is one of our biggest weaknesses. It's the essence of cardiovascular inflammation. Um, the opposite, if you go back to high school chemistry, the opposite, uh, the antidote for oxidation is reduction or also called in the vitamin world, antioxidation. The antioxidants, vitamins A, C, and E, have become a huge, mega, mega market. But the body always, almost always has a better way of dealing with a problem than 
supplements or medications or anything like that. In this case, the best antioxidation is the body itself. And it uses a vitamin. It uses a vitamin complex, B vitamin complex, but it uses methyl groups instead of hydrogen ions. Technical comment I won't go any deeper into right now, other than to say, without getting into all the geekiness and all of the genetic testing, because over half of us have some level of, um, of problem associated with uh, methylation, believe it or not. You thought that was, again, some crazy urban myth on the, inter on the internet. There's truth to it. Don't, you don't need to get genetic testing. All you need to do is just get some of these methylated B vitamin complexes. I know that uh, Thorn, Thorn Methyl Guard Plus is the one I use. You just get them right on Amazon. There are other, uh, you know, just get one of the reputable vitamin uh, supplement manufacturers and um, take their methylated B vitamin complex. Now I had a, a, somebody say, well, I'm doing that. They're still having problems. And you can often, often still see uh, elevated homocysteine, but if you're taking these, you're okay. But I started looking at what he was taking and he was taking regular B vitamin complex. He was not taking methylated. So remember that part, take the methylated B vitamin complex. Thank you for bringing it up. Great topic. Parker Reed, good, uh, a, a good uh, participant, somebody who's provided a lot of information to us. References to Bolt of Lightning, 100% spot on as we discussed and need to share my side. Yes, uh, so Parker, let, let us know when you're ready to, uh, to come talk to us. Parker, I think, was going to come talk to us a few months ago, and then some things happened with his business. The, the invitation still stands, Parker. Thank you so much. Ewandro Magales. Uh, Ewandro is, a, is a, um, an associate and friend uh, who has shared several things on here. And thank you so much for, that's a super chat if folks, yeah. Um, Gilbert is showing that up on the top. And if you'd like to uh, donate a few bucks, like uh, Ewandro has, uh, 20 bucks is a big deal, especially in terms of, you know, some of the um, the economies in the world, like the Filipino economy. It helps us get this information out there and um, produced in a way where it's attractive to people. It draws eyeballs and people can actually start saying, ah, I can improve my health. Thank you again, Awandro. Do you recommend exercising fasted? Yes, I do. I don't seem to do well on it. I know it's, it's hard. So what they're talking about, and you'll see that a lot with recommendations, people fasting, you know, prolonged fasting or mo most often intermittent fasting where people will, um, if they're exercising in the morning, like uh, fast, overnight and get up and exercise before you, uh, before you eat. What that does is it stresses your systems more, stresses your metabolism, stresses your ability to draw energy without pulling it from recent carbs or recent uh, meals. And that's hard. That pushes on your body. Have you ever heard of the term hormesis? Hormesis is a challenge to your body. But it's a challenge that you respond to and then you end up healthier after you go through the challenge. You know, if you've heard, you've heard that old statement many times, uh, what doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Um, there's some of that concept there and there's some truth to it. So thank you again, Awandro, for the super chat. Thank you for the question. It was a good one. Sam Kampschmidt, Dr. Brewer. I have LP little a of approximately 130. Um, you know, there's several people that are on this video. Some of them have shared already. They have LP little a problems. And yes, we've, uh, we've had, uh, folks on the, on the channel talk about it and we'll have more. And thank you for sharing that you have that problem. Tired looking for name. Thank you so much. Tired, uh, tired is giving a super chat as well. 20 bucks. I appreciate it. And 
again, it helps us get that information out there. It helps us save lives. So you're helping save lives too. Thank you. Uh, David DiPietro, are also, are you starting patients with LP little a on low-dose aspirin and giving, giving that? So here, <clears throat> even though the medical community has neglected the LP little a issue for a long time, you'll t still tend to see something that even though it's wrong to, to ignore LP little a, there is something that is correct that has been done, and that is the understanding and acknowledgement that cardiovascular disease is almost always multifactorial. So for example, you know, if we're getting older, there's not much you can do about that. If you're getting insulin resistant, yeah, you know what? There's stuff you can do for that. You can't stop, you, you know, stopping getting older is not a, not an option, but uh, body fat may be a hard option to deal with, but at least it's an option. There are a lot of options depending on the specific risk factor that you're talking about. As we discussed, um, low dose aspirin. We, we, I'm reviewing a, 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 um, a blog article that we're going to be posting soon about low dose aspirin and about um, fish oils associated with cardiovascular risk. In fact, with low-dose aspirin, what you have tended to hear in the headlines is wrong. A couple of studies came out. The Aspire trial, the, uh, no, Aspire trial, and I can't remember the, the other ones. Maybe Aspire was one of them. And they said, um, low-dose aspirin is not indicated for primary prevention anymore. Well, I never really gave low dose. I mean, I, I did maybe 25, 30 years ago, but for the past decade, I've never recommended low dose aspirin for primary prevention. <clears throat> and so, but I do recommend a lot of uh, low dose aspirin. So what's the disconnect here? Here's the disconnect. It's in the term primary versus secondary prevention. Primary prevention is you don't have the disease, you don't have any evidence of the disease. That's a big deal in cardiovascular disease because guess what? If you have plaque, you now have disease. This is no longer primary prevention. So in the past, you used to see groups like the American, uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, the U.S. Uh, PSTF, recommend uh, baby aspirin. American Heart Association recommend ba baby aspirin, usually at age 60, sometimes age 65, sometimes age 55, but just based on age alone. That is primary prevention. They have all, all of those groups have still said, look, if the, we're talking about secondary prevention, we still recommend it. Those haven't changed. Well, since they backed off on the primary prevention, uh, articles like ones appearing in the New York Times and other ones, the headline said, baby aspirin no longer recommended. Hmm, major misinterpretation. If you've got plaque, this is no longer a primary prevention issue. So be aware of what you're reading and how to interpret it. Thank you for bringing it up, David. It was a big issue and not just for LP little a patients. Another, another from David. Since it increases your chance of causing a clot if you rupture a plaque, or do you do a, cal a CT calcium score first, technically? Not sure exactly where that question fits in all of this, but the bottom line is, number one, assess the situation. Find out if you have plaque. Find out if you have soft plaque. Find out if you have calcium. You know, a calcium score will help tell you if you have plaque. It just won't tell you if you have soft plaque. A CM, CIMT is the only thing that's going to tell you that. The uh, other thing to find out is, do you have trouble metabolizing carbs? And if you do, you need to have uh, a hard look at why and how often and how much are you eating them. So, and if you have plaque, I clearly recommend consideration of baby aspirin. 
I hate to say this because so many people hate them, but I also clearly recommend that you consider a statin. David Pietro, since it, okay, let's go to another one. Bambi Gage, good morning, Bambi. Good to hear from you. Bambi's been with us for years. Uninsurable, I'd love to have a CGM, continuous glucose monitor. Libre being the one that's been out there for a while. There was a Dexcom, uh, first the one, the two, the three. Now we're on Dexcom six, I think. Uh, my doctor wouldn't prescribe it for me. Do you prescribe scripts for that or would I need to sign up for your program? Uh, call Michelle. Uh, if you, uh, uh, Gilbert, if you'll give them Michelle, uninsurable Michelle's number. Michelle has a specific program. I have a, a place in my heart for people trying to get a CGM. I don't think it should be prescription related. I am able to write prescriptions in every state of the union. I have I'm licensed in all 50 states and active in those licenses. So call Michelle and she can help you get set up with a program specifically for that. John Bundy, from your earlier remarks, Marfans can also cause mitral valve. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you so much, John. Um, I've got that in my own family. So, of course, I should have mentioned that. Marco Holzklotner, Marco from Serbia. And no wonder I can't pronounce that last name. And I don't think I've ever seen comments from Serbia on the channels. Thank you so much for sharing that, Marco. Gerard Webster, calculated my HOMA IR at 1.9. Need to get it down. Any advice? All the things we talk about in terms of improving re insulin resistance. I will tell you this. Gerard, I get nervous about people uh, just looking at HOMA IR. I'm actually okay if you've looked at your HOMA IR and you, and you realize you have a problem. <clears throat> the concerns that I have are people that have looked at their HOMA IR and said, I don't have a problem based on that. And here's why. That is still a snapshot. And it's still usually based on fasting insulin and fasting glucose. I've seen people with really good numbers. I see them all the time with really good numbers for both glucose and fasting glucose and fasting insulin, but major problems as soon as they're challenged with glucose. So thank you for sharing that. GLR, are there any CGMs available over the counter in the U.S.? Uh, you know what? <clears throat> I heard about three or four weeks ago that there's one coming out that doesn't require a prescription. As we learn more about that, we will let you know. Gator, when metformin is very useful, while metformin is a very useful drug, like it, like any, it has side effects. And that's the truth. 20% of folks get gas, abdominal discomfort, even diarrhea with metformin. Now with most of that 20%, it subsides as, you know, over the, the next few weeks but not with all. A1C, uh, is there an A1C where you would rather de-prescribe it for a lifestyle controlled type uh, two diabetes? It's really a personal choice. Um, again, I've got, I've got plenty of folks that are saying, I still wanna take it anyway because there's evidence that it improves the gut biome, maybe associated with that, um, those symptoms, Gator. Uh, and sure enough, people that are taking um, metformin tend to get more of a non-insulin resistant type gut biome. And you're saying, is that real? Is that true? Yes. You know, a lot of people think gut biome is, doesn't have good science behind it. It's got good science. Um, the gut biome of People with insulin resistance tends to have fewer types of species and a lot more of those, a lot more um, uh, samples of those fewer uh, species. People with a, without insulin resistance tend to have a broader scope of different types of species. And sure enough, people that are taking, ins uh, not insulin, people that are taking metformin tend to get that better um, Gut biome. Another interesting fact, in this age of um, uh, P 
penicillin resistant, you know, antibiotic resistant um, uh, gut bugs that cause significant problems and actually even re uh, resulting in the need for a stool transplant. Yes, that sounds awful. And yes, it's real. Um, you see it with C. difficile. You may have heard that term, Clostridium difficile. It's a it's named that. It's a bacterium that has caused many, many problems. It's antibiotic resistant. That's where the term difficile comes from. Why am I talking about that? Well, people that have, uh, they've first discovered it in those stool transplants. If the donor, the stool donor had diabetes and the new, uh, and the recipient didn't, it put that recipient at risk for prediabetes or diabetes. So there's, there's some stuff there about the gut biome that's just very interesting. Vagabond Sojourner, a $10 uh, super chat donation. Thank you so much, Vagabond. We appreciate it. And then again, it'll help us get life-saving information out to others in this world. I appreciate your service, Dr. Brewer. You could be on a beach somewhere. That's right. <laughs> sipping on a mint julep. Instead, you're here helping us stay alive. God bless you. And God bless you too, Vagabond. Uh, you didn't have to give us that super chat and, and contribute to what we're doing, but you did. And you showed interest. And thank you so much. We do appreciate it. Thomas Handyside, um, $25. So, th so again, thank you so much. We appreciate the, um, the super chats, the donations. They do make a difference. Thomas Handyside, any benefit to apple cider vinegar? I think yes. I've heard anecdotal evidence that it may help with the Dawn effect, which is a curse of mine. So first thing I would say, up to 20% 20 20 of people with insulin resistance and prediabetes have problems with Dawn effect. If you haven't heard of that, it's having high blood sugar even before you eat in the morning. And that, um, how does that happen? That happens because... Um, we have what's called a diurnal cortisol level. Cortisol tends to start peaking at two to five o'clock in the morning. And people that like to say, well, that's because of X, Y, and Z would say, well, that's because people are getting ready to get up and go about their day. It's probably true. It makes sense anyway. Cortisol raises the blood sugar. So, actually you'll tend to see an increase in prevalence or the number of people that have Dawn effect as they get more and more um, fat driven in their metabolism. How and why? Because, you know, being fat driven, uh, often you're, you're pushing your body, you're going through that hormesis stress um, and that in and of itself can push a little bit more um, of the, um, cortisol. So that's what's going on. I will tell you this. Uh, one of the major, there's several ways to deal with it. Uh, I haven't heard of apple cider vinegar as a way to do it. The, the major thing with apple cider vinegar is that it lowers the, the uh, gastric pH, the stomach pH, and therefore decreases emptying of the stomach contents into the intestine. Well, with dawn effect, you haven't eaten anything, so you're not, there's nothing, there's no gastric emptying to slow down. The other major thing that I tend to advise most of my people that are concerned about dawn effect is don't. The vast majority of people don't have significant levels. They're not reaching levels of 140, 180, 190 from their dawn effect. The vast majority of dawn effect types types of impacts are significantly lower. If yours is lower, worry more about the times when it goes over 140. Worry more about times where you, uh, you can control that blood sugar. Don't worry about your body pushing that a little bit. It usually pushes to more healthy levels. Vijaya Achar, Vijaya Achar. Where are you from, Vijaya? Hello, doctor. I started taking niacin immediate release, 250 milligrams daily, and my C HS, high sensitivity, CRP, C-reactive protein, went from 2.14 to 7.57 before taking and after taking for a week, respectively. Is there any correlation to niacin in there? 
That's certainly a, a possibility. Uh, uh, C-reactive protein is a protein made by the liver. It's an indicator of cardiovascular inflammation, but it's also an indicator of a whole bunch of other types of inflammation. For example, if we give 100 people a flu shot today, simple flu shot, within 48 hours, we know that 66 of that 100 people, two-thirds will have an elevation of their C-reactive protein. So I don't look at just C-reactive protein alone. Most, uh, most of the very few doctors that do look at cardiovascular inflammation usually only test with CRP. I don't test only with CRP because of this issue. In fact, C-reactive protein is by far the most common source of biological false positives for cardiovascular testing. What do I mean by that? Biological meaning it's a true false, uh, it's an increase in, in uh, C-reactive protein. It's not, I mean, it's biologically true, but if you're assuming that that C-reactive protein is elevating because of cardiovascular disease, that's often incorrect. It's often something else. So I look, what, what do I do then? I look for other things. I look for microbiome and creatinine ratio, uh, evidence of leaking in the protein, microscopic leaking in the protein, leaking of protein into the urine. I look at LP, uh, PLA2, or called, also called plaque 2 not to be confused with LP little a. Plaque 2 is one of the enzymes that your immune system releases when it attacks plaque in your artery wall. Let me just check my, uh, you know what? I've got patients coming up and I had no idea that that we were going so long. I am. I apologize, but I am going to have to uh, to end our um, end our our uh, event today. I'm sorry. We've been going on for pushing two hours anyway. Thank you so much for your interest.